I wanted to introduce you to a friend of mine who is Larissa Milne, who is an award-winning travel writer. Uh, she and her husband write at changesinlongitude.com and also recently wrote a book about Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Liberty Trail. But I've invited Larissa to take part in this course because she has stayed in Airbnbs. I think last year you stayed at Airbnbs about 150 nights. Yeah, probably, maybe even a little bit more than that, but yes. So we're going to be using Larissa's expertise throughout this course in terms of what does somebody who is actually looking at your listing on Airbnb, what are they looking for? Larissa, let's talk about safety because I think one of the big questions that people have for Airbnb before they open up their home to strangers staying in is the same question you probably had before you started booking nights is how do I know that I won't be staying in the home of a crazy person. How do I know that I won't be inviting crazy people into my home? Okay, well, concerning safety, Chris, I just want to point out that my perspective is, is solely from the guest's perspective because, as you know, my husband and I try, are nomadic, so we are only Airbnb guests. We do not host them. But when we're looking for a destination, the reviews come in and play a major part from a standpoint of safety. Uh, our feeling is that if a destination has a few, several or even a few reviews and they're generally positive that we're probably dealing with somebody who's a relatively normal individual. Uh, my thought is that if anybody was really too out there and too strange, uh, the reviews wouldn't be good and they wouldn't stay on the site for very long. When you're looking at a listing, what first grabs your attention about the listing? Is it the description, the headline, or the pictures? I think it's probably the photograph, the initial photograph, not necessarily the, the pictures in general, but I like to see something that shows me a good representation of the place I'm staying, something that's tidy and neat, and then I look at a quick, the, the overall headline, if it says comfortable room in quiet neighborhood or whatever, then uh, that, that would be the second thing I would look at. But for me, the first thing is a photo. Is it Does it look like the sort of place I'd be comfortable staying? And you'd be surprised how many people just plain old either don't make their bed or have a fuzzy <laughs> photograph uh, or choose for some reason to show you a photograph of the toilet as the lead photo. I mean, these are all very basic things, but when you see them out there, you think, wow, what were they thinking? I know that, for instance, when you and your husband look for a place, you look for a place in a quiet neighborhood while some other people are looking for nightlife. So there are different segments of the audience who are looking for Airbnb, looking for different places to stay. How many different categories can you come up with? Different categories. Well, outside of the basic categories of entire place and private room and shared room you're talking about? Yeah, in terms of the audience that a place is targeting. So, for instance, quiet versus nightlife. Uh, wow, that's an interesting question. I don't know that I've ever thought of it in that context. I would say that probably, uh, yeah, quiet neighborhood type of thing, uh, close to the nightlife, maybe near something that's near the action or near the various uh, tourism destinations. Another one would be something that's near public transportation or one that offers plenty of room if you're driving your own car. Um, those are the ones that jump to mind right now. You know, if you're in the suburbs, you can't target where where the happening place you target the quiet place and if you're yeah. versus you know the other way around yeah and so partially it's just give people a thought of how as a guest or do you think about those places yeah instant booking do you use instant booking only occasionally um although we've we've stayed at so many that we qualify for instant booking at, at most places uh i generally like to ask a few questions so that's really the main reason why I don't use instant booking. I, I often have a question or two for, for the What questions do you have? I might have a, have a question about, for example, the neighborhood. Is it a quiet neighborhood? Uh, how fast is your internet? That's particularly important for me as a travel blogger who travels. Uh, so there's, there inevitably is some question I want to ask. What's the number one thing that people leave out of their descriptions that you can't believe they don't understand that you want? The thing that 
is often frustrating, and this is where I often have to clarify, is exactly what type of a space you're getting and what is going to be private and what is going to be shared. Uh, I find that some people actually interpret the entire place listing as someone has a private room in your home, but they have access to your public living room and your shared kitchen, and they consider that a, pri a, a an entire place. And there are other times people don't list whether the bathroom is private or shared or what have you. You show up at a place, you've looked at the description online, you've seen the pictures. What's the worst surprise you've had? Probably the worst surprise would be thinking that we had our own place and when in fact somebody's interpretation of an entire place was that we had a private room but had free use of all the public spaces in their home and we thought we were going to a private apartment. Okay. Now, you have chosen sometimes to go to a place that is a shared place. Mm -hmm. So it's more an issue of that you knew what you were getting from the description. Yes, and, and I'll just, as a slight backup, uh, yeah, if we're going to be somewhere for a few nights, we oftentimes will just go for the listing that falls into the category of a private room in someone's home, and we're fine with that. But when we're staying somewhere a little bit longer, uh, several nights, week, a month, we want our own apartment or cottage or whatever. And so my interpretation of the entire place listing is that you have free reign and you are the sole occupant of that place you are renting. So yeah, it's a manage matter, matter of managing expectations. What's the best surprise you have found when you showed up at a place? The best surprise is probably people who provide lots of nice little uh, little niceties, I guess is the best way to put it. First of all, I do, I do like to have breakfast. And while I don't expect a lavish, you know, five course brunch or anything like that, I think that guests or the host should provide some sort of breakfast. But the nicest surprise is when they provide little extras. Uh, there might be in the refrigerator, if there's a refrigerator in the guest room or, or in the kitchen, they provide uh, some cold drinks in the fridge or some fresh local chocolate or fresh flowers or something, just something like that that makes you feel welcome and makes you feel like it's just a step above some impersonal uh, lodging choice that you might have made. What's the best local item that someone has made that made you feel welcome, not just to the home, but to the region? Ah, that would, that would have to be the, the award-winning salsa we got in Albuquerque, New Mexico. One of the things that we did, one of the reasons we picked this place was um, it was a, a private room in someone's home and we were traveling through Albuquerque and she just mentioned that she was uh, an award-winning she had won a salsa competition and she made salsa. So we got there and uh, she didn't have any available, but we said we had heard about it and that we were excited to learn perhaps how she made salsa. And right away she said, I'll make some. So she went downstairs and started roasting up peppers and making her own uh, roasted jalapeno salsa. So that was uh, pretty special. Number one thing that turns you off about a particular description in Airbnb? The description or the, the overall listing? Just, just the description. Okay. For now. I would say the thing that turns me off the most is if somebody, when somebody lists the house rules and they have an, an unending litany of do's and don'ts uh, <laughs> in the actual listing. I think that that information is important, and I'd like to see it when I check into the to the house or the uh, the room. But I don't want to see something right there on the listing that tells me wipe your feet and a lot of this common sense stuff. It it kind of sends an unwelcoming message. What are the important rules to include in your listing? First and foremost for me is the smoking issue. I'm, I'm a pretty vehement non-smoker. And so if somebody's a smoker, that's their business. But I do not want to stay in a house where smoking is condoned. And that's a little bit fuzzy in the Airbnb listings sometimes. Um, 
also the idea of how late uh, the like the party hours or non-party hours. A lot of people will mention that that you know it's a quiet neighborhood. We want you know quiet hours after between ten and ten p.m. and seven a.m. something like that. Or to list that this is a please note that this is a, a very lively area. So if you're a light sleeper, you might want to consider going elsewhere. I think that's important that the host be realistic about the type of guests that they're looking to have and they don't, again, to manage expectations that way. So noise and smoking are probably the two big issues. Speaking of managing expectations, what was a stay that you had that you would have left a higher rating if you had just known one thing ahead of time that they left out of their description? We stayed at a, um, at a house in Montana where we were renting a room in a home and the, um, the owner had, had contacted us to let us know that she would not be there that night, uh, which was fine. She gave us all the information about where to access the house and she said, you know, there'll be uh, a refrigerator, a small fridge in your room for breakfast items and what have you. What she didn't tell us was that she had a, a subtenant that also lived in the house that would be showing up later that night. So we were under the impression we would have the house to ourselves and it was quite alarming to have this guy show up at 10.30 at night and say, I live here. So it all worked out fine in the end, but it was just, just a little bit of advance warning would have uh, changed our impression of that place. You sometimes do longer term stays. Yes. I know that you advised us when we were getting started that you can lose long-term stays if you don't have some sort of discount for people who are staying longer term. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations in terms of what kind of discount you look for if you're doing a week-long stay or a month-long stay? Yeah, typically what I would expect is, first of all, that the price for a long-term stay would be cheaper than a nightly stay. And, and I think that people do miss out on opportunities. If, if I'm going in there and I want to stay for, for a week or a month, if all of a sudden it just takes the nightly rate and multiplies it by the number of nights. So I, I think what I would recommend to people is think of how many, um, how much money or what type of revenue you would like to, to generate from your Airbnb stay uh, in a one month period and then back into that for a one month stay. So for instance, if your goal is to have your rooms booked every weekend for four weeks in a row and you're charging $100 a night, uh, so it's eight nights for argument's sake, uh, that would be $800 that you would hope to clear for a month, then you might want to say that, okay, well if somebody's going to stay for a month, we're going to charge maybe a little bit more than that, $1,000 a month uh, if they're actually staying for a month because you've already made more than you expected to make for uh, the month in the stay. Does that sound, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I know when we were setting up our Airbnb and we were talking to you about the descriptions, one of the things you said was a minimum. There were two things that were, I think, your hot buttons, breakfast yes. and a door that locks. Yes. Are there other things on your list that people shouldn't, advertise on Airbnb until they have at least these minimums? I, I think the, the basic, um, basic toiletries, shampoo, soap in the shower, a few, extra, the, a few extra toiletries like a spare toothbrush and things are nice little things. You had asked me earlier about those kind of things. Those aren't really necessary, but I think you expect uh, to have shampoo and soap. And on the topic of soap, I would say that uh, either in small individual soaps in the shower and by the sink or uh, liquid soap because no, I don't think anybody wants to use a partially used bar of soap when they check into someplace. 